know that that number I gave about a third. Had you ever heard of that? That that a third of businesses are now freelancers and um, no. yeah, I, I was really I was surprised. And mm-hmm. we just got numbers. Um, you know, you talk about working with your SBDC. I work mm-hmm. part time with our Portland Community College SBDC. And we just got numbers from the Small Business Administration Office of Advocacy, and they've done this report, and they are telling us that 78% of businesses in the whole country never hire an employee. Mm. I was stunned when I got that number. 78% yeah. of small businesses never hire an employee. And, you know, I'm thinking, Yahoo! You know, our day <laughs> of celebrating the solo is definitely here. You know, um, what we like to say at Better, Smarter, Richer, you know, in our, our work together is that uh, this is the business model for the 21st century. It's the bo- model for encores uh, like you and me, and it's the model for many, many professionals. It's the model for creatives, and, you know, it's how people are uh, taking care of their own financial well-being um, when they can't or don't want to. Uh, find a job or if they can't Mm -hmm. find a job that suits them Um, because there's certainly a lot of that going on. So I just think it's a very exciting time. And also as people are aging healthier, Mm -hmm. um, they're at a point in their lives often where they may think, well, this is the time for me to retire, but I'm not really ready to retire. I don't want to keep doing the thing I'm doing, but I want to do something different. And so you're taking – there you have a population of people who are older, more experienced, have more free time, mm-hmm. um, and are willing to take some risks that you can't yeah. do when you're younger and you have you know, children who are depending on you. That's right. I think, that, I think that's certainly um, part of all of this. It's a very exciting time. So let's get back to Life Stories Remembered. How do you, how do you actually get the inspiration to begin uh, your company, Life Stories Remembered? Well, it's a great story. Are you ready? I am. <laughs> Um, through my involvement in the community, I became friends with Judge Max Rosen, who was the, was the judge of the Third Circuit Federal Court. He was a renowned attorney and jurist and one of the most respected legal authorities, not only in Northeast Pennsylvania, but in the country. He actively practiced until he was age 95 when he oh, died. Oh, good for him. And he and I would often talk, and he would share amazing memories with me of his childhood. He had total recall of dates, names, and events from those early years. And I asked him if he had uh, preserved those memories in some form, and he said that he'd been, he'd been asked, he'd been interviewed about his life as a lawyer, his life as a judge, and he'd been asked to dictate his memories about his early years, in uh, in a recorder, a, 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 a cassette recorder, which now is like ancient history. Um, <laughs> and he said that that did not appeal to him, so he declined those offers. But when I suggested that I interview him in person, he was very interested, which shows you the power of the person, personal connection, the one-on-one yes. connection. Yes. And... Um, So in the following weeks, I developed, this is in 2003, in the following weeks, I developed an outline, um, and I sent it to him, and he reviewed it, and we arranged for, he arranged for one of his former secretaries to transcribe the the tapes, the cassette tapes, at the conclusion of the interviews, and we agreed to meet in his chambers on January 16, 2003, a very significant event for me, and we had no further discussion about the length or scope of the project. At that first meeting, Judge Rosen asked his secretary to hold all of his calls. He closed the door to his chambers and seated himself on the sofa. At that point, I knew we were in for something important. I started the tape recorder, and he began with, where do you want to start? And we talked about his very early years, which, of course, included his parents, and grandparents, and now we're talking about people who were living in the 1800s. And um, I, my thought was that maybe we would meet together for, you know, an hour or two. We had never talked about how long this was going to be. Well, 
In fact, the interviews extended over a period of 25 weeks, six months. Wow. And when it was wow. transcribed, it came to 400 pages. Holy he, moly. He had yes, a lot to it, say. it really was amazing. He truly enjoyed the experience, and, and years later after his death, his sons were just thrilled to have had that firsthand material. I had asked him if his sons and grandchildren knew the stories he was sharing with me, and he said that they knew some of it, but much of it would be new to them. And it was really at that moment that our work together, I realized, had a, a very, played a very significant role. So he insisted on doing the first edit himself. This is after our 25 weeks together. And, um, and he set December 2005 as his deadline, because it took us that long to be able to get to the point of actually uh, re reviewing the transcription. So that was December 2005, and early that January 2006, he became ill, and he died on February 7, 2006. So between the time he completed the editing, his, his version of the editing, and the time he died was a very short period of time. But I really felt that... For him, it was a, a part of closing the book, closing the book of his life. Yes. And um, so that was, you know, the germ of where the idea was born. And others encouraged me to do it as a business. Um, and I really did not see myself in that, doing that kind of work. But I researched the area of uh, personal, uh, personal historians. And I found that at the time, no one was offering such a business locally. Um, and I was also looking, as I mentioned before, to create a business that would allow me to work from home. And except mm -hmm. for the interview part, the rest of it, the rest of it does. And then when I consulted the contact of the Small Business Development Center, it all began to come together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that, was, that was the beginning of it all. <laughs> I think that's absolutely wonderful, you know, and many businesses start because, um, you know, not because people go out and make these, you know, gigantic plan and then go, you know, implement the plan, but they start more organically, like what you're talking about, where you had an idea and uh, a client shows up and you, you know, you begin to work together and, it, you know, they, the client helps shape your idea of what's going to happen. And I mean, that happens a lot you know, in a, in a, a business. And uh, I, I'm delighted for the Small Business Development Center that you speak highly of it because that's one of the things we, we really pride ourselves on doing is helping yes. people turn that idea and that start into, uh, you know, a business, really turn mm -hmm. it into a business. And, and, a wonderful uh, resource. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we've started at our SBDC, we've just started a whole Encore Entrepreneur Program and uh, we're talking about how we're helping people monetize their expertise mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, what they've learned throughout their life. We're helping them uh, imagine uh, a service, a business or a service, and how they can, you know, turn it into something that will either support them or supplement their support in their retirement. And um, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. It's very mm -hmm. exciting to hear these stories. So good for you. Good for mm -hmm. you. And I assume uh, clients have continued to come. Yes, and have continued to refer other clients, which is, uh, which is the best, that's the best yeah. of all. Perfect. That's perfect. So mm -hmm. my next question was, how do you market your services? Maybe it just comes totally on referrals, or do you go out and talk about what you're doing? Well, since I, wanna, I want to keep this part-time, mm -hmm. um, I have really done a low-key job of marketing and mm -hmm. having people uh, pass the word along by word of mouth has really uh, been a wonderful way for me to market. There are some times that I go out and talk to groups or advertise various places, but it's very low-key. So mm -hmm. it's really primarily uh, word of mouth. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, what came up for me is that um, there are more people, I think, now doing what you're talking about, but uh, there might be some things that, uh, you do that are pretty specific to uh, being a personal historian is the way that you called it. I love those mm -hmm. words. And, you know, there might be some techniques and things that you have that if you ever got tired of actually being just a, I don't mean just, but only a personal <laughs> historian, 
you know, where you might be able to teach other people some of your uh, techniques and tools and things that you do, um, you know, that, that um, uh, could be another stream of income for you. I mean, that's very possible that Good. you could write a, a how-to book or, you know, publish an <laughs> e-book and make that happen. So there. I'm a, I'm a doer rather than a teller. So yeah. I like to do, but you're absolutely right. You know, at some point in time, for sure, I certainly have, you know, um, I, I have some, have learned some important things that I could pass along to people. Yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if if the mood hits you someday, there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's, that's out there and that's possible to do. It'll so, be the next um, chapter. Yeah, the next chapter. <laughs> so, you know, who, so who's been some of your clients? Is it? Only wealthy, famous people, or is it, you know, some ordinary people where they just simply have a story? Who hire you? The in, well, the first thing is important to say is that everybody has a life story. Mm-hmm. And so often people will say to me, my life was very boring. And um, no life is boring. Some, life may be, some lives may be more exciting than others, but no life is boring when it is heard by people who have not been part of that life. So, for Mm -hmm. example, with Judge Rosen, one of the things I asked him at one point in time when he was talking about going to school as a young kid, I asked him um, what clothes he wore, what what were his clothes, and he talked about knickers. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I don't think any kids today have any idea what knickers are, but it painted a picture, you know, it helped paint a picture of that time. So so everybody has a, a life story. Um, but some of the clients that I, I have had, have, it's all been fascinating. I've been fortunate to have interviewed a, a wide range of people, from, um, uh, from med- medical doctors, attorneys, educators, uh, generous uh, folks who have given a, a great deal of time and money in our community, um, a man who uh, worked himself up, um, from working in the coal mines, which years ago was uh, was very much a part of Northeast Pennsylvania, worked himself up from working in the coal mines as a ch- as a child and talking about what those experiences were like, um, including a, a gentleman who is uh, whose family line goes back hundreds of years here, and many places are named after parts of, of his family. Wow. So. It's very, uh, you know, it's very broad. And, well, you know, fa- fa- uh, family businesses are yet another component of this because mm-hmm. family businesses have a life story as well and yes. multi-generational businesses. And so there, too, I've been able to preserve memories of several family businesses, which started with only one person and grew to be multi-million dollar businesses which was fascinating. Um, And along those lines is also, sometimes people think that when you're doing this kind of interviewing, it's kind of the end of your life and, you know, this is what you're leaving. But, um, in fact, we all all have chapters in our lives. And so one of my clients is a middle-aged woman who said, you know, lots of different chapters. And she, um, she wanted to preserve those memories with her, with the intention of, five years, ten years from now, going back and adding the next chapter. So this mm-hmm. is not just for people who are, um, you know, towards the, the older stage of their life. She also could share a lot of memories about her parents and grandparents, and, um, and those were things she didn't want to forget. So it's a wide yeah. range of people. That's fantastic. So, um, you know, obviously, my question is, do you think it's important for people to – have a chance to tell their story. I mean, it sounds like you really do. Yeah. It's an important well, piece think, in life. Exactly. I think anyone who helps to pre- preserve memories provides an important role uh, to, the, to themselves, to their family, and to the larger community. Mm-hmm. And, and if they're not preserved, they're gone forever. And, and I often uh, refer to an African proverb that I, I'm, I'm sure you have heard. Um, when a person dies, it's as if, it is as if a library burns to the ground. Wow. And I think that's very profound. Very. Uh, you know, some books in a library are, have great significance, some have minor significance, but they're all important, just as our lives. Um, so I, 
I think that uh, preserving memories so that they're not gone forever is key. One of my 